Okay, cool. Well, hi, everybody. So, uh, again, my name is Fraser Kane, and I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and we've brought together once again the uh, finest minds in space and astronomy journalism to talk about the weekly roundup of uh, crazy space news that's happened this week. And uh, it's a, sort of a special week this week because uh, of the American Astronomical Society meeting the, that's happened in Austin, Texas, and many of the participants have been there and have been deluged with space news. And, uh, and so we're going to probably put a lot of our emphasis on, on those topics this week. So I'll introduce the, uh, the participants. So, and again, it's, it's how I see them and, and not necessarily how you see them or how I feel about them in any order, <laughs> shape, or form. So, so we've got Alan Boyle from MSNBC, Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society, uh, Ian O'Neill from Discovery News, John Voisey from Universe Today, and he's also the Angry Astronomer, Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today, Nicole Gallucci, I don't know where you're from, Nicole. <laughs> Earth. Uh, Earth. From Earth. From planet Earth. Um, University no, of UVA. She's um, the noisy astronomer. Noisy astronomer. astronomer. Our claimer. Soon. <laughs> Discovery News. Discovery yeah, News. Yeah, and yeah, right. Discovery News. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Pamela Gay. I work for several of these people. Um, my co-host <laughs> at Astronomy Cast. And, of course, Dr. Phil Plate, the bad astronomer. And, uh, hey, hey. <laughs> and so we're going to cover... Um, a round of news. Now, we've got five stories that we thought we would queue up. Uh, the first one is just the discovery of exoplanets everywhere, and lot big ones, small ones, Saturny ones, that the galaxy probably has more planets than stars, so it's, you know, there's a lot of planets out there. Uh, some very cool mapping of dark matter. Uh, a, the, the race to create an actual tricorder. Uh, which is going to be really cool. What color the Milky Way really is, not milky. And uh, some, some news on the Dawn mission reaching uh, a new uh, altitude mapping orbit. So let's just start up at the top. And this is going to be the, the story that the Milky Way probably has more than 100 billion worlds, more worlds than, uh, than stars. So Ian, you, you wrote an article on this week, so why don't you take a crack at it. And I'm going to try and screen share uh, your article while you talk. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, as, as Fraser said, it's been a bit of a crazy week for space news in general, but uh, especially exoplanets. And usually we get a sneak peek of uh, the news before it breaks. And so, of course, we kind of had some embargo press releases ready to go, all sorted out. I think it was for Wednesday. Uh, it was before. It was on Tuesday. We were busy writing all these articles. But as Salt law dictates we kind of had uh, more news than we could deal with and it literally was a deluge of uh, press releases from institutions and uh, space telescopes and other projects on the ground and basically the upshot is that there is way more well estimated to be way more exoplanets than previously believed now one project actually that wasn't um, discussed in the AAS this week, but it actually comes from the Space Science Institute um, in uh, oh, Baltimore. Baltimore, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to this country, what can I say? Um, and they, they did a release uh, basically saying that using a, um, a lesser used technique to detect exoplanets called microlensing, I'll, I'll discuss what that, actually that means, in a, in a short time, but basically using microlensing, um, a group of exoplanets have been discovered around a certain number of stars. Now, from that, they can extrapolate what, how many exoplanets there could be in the, in, the, in the Milky Way. Now, previously, using the Kepler Space Telescope, estimates have been made, um, and the Kepler Science team came forward, it was about a year ago, in fact, to the month, I think, or unless it was February last year, they came, up, came with the estimate to say that the, uh, our galaxy is stuffed full of exoplanets. Ma majority of them are smaller worlds, and now this is critical if we're trying to find um, Earth analogs. Obviously, Earth-sized planets, not Earth-like planets, is a big difference. But there seems to be a preponderance of smaller worlds in the Milky Way. Now, they put an estimate at 50 billion, um, 50 billion 
exoplanets orbiting the stars in the Milky Way, which is an astonishing number. Um, and they only did this by looking at a small portion of sky. There's about 100,000 stars in the field of view of Kepler. And they were able to extrapolate by looking at the, the number of exoplanets they've actually discovered in that small sampling of, of uh, stars in the, in the Milky Way. They were able to upscale it and say, OK, there's probably around about um, 50 billion, a minimum of 50 billion uh, exoplanets in the, the Milky Way. It's a number we will never actually arrive at, certainly, but it's, uh, it's, it's an estimate. Now, from the, uh, the Space Science Institute, um, they've, they've come forward with a paper and they actually use a different method, not the same method that Kepler uses, but microlensing. And microlensing is when a star passes in front of another star randomly in the sky. I mean, this isn't dependent on star selection. It's not looking at one tiny area in the night sky. It's just looking as broad an area as possible in the night sky to see a star pass in front of another star. Now, when a star drifts in front of another star, a, there is a, bright, a brightening of the background star, and that's caused by the lensing effect, by the gravity of the star in the foreground. So using Einstein's general theory of general relativity, um, the, the light will get bent around the gravitational well of that star. It basically becomes a, a magnifying glass of the background star. Now, using a really, really clever technique, they're able to see if that foreground star has any exoplanets in orbit. And they're able to do this with a, a massive degree of accuracy. And I believe they can uh, they actually favor smaller, they can actually find very, very small worlds orbiting these stars. So by looking for these microlensing events, these little brightenings in the sky, they're able to do a search for exoplanets. And there's quite a few exoplanets that have been discovered through this method, but it's, it's more of a random process. And the best thing about this, because it is a random process, they're taking a random sampling of the sky. It doesn't depend on the star you're looking at. It's just a random event that when the star passes in front of another star. And using this as a, a basis for uh, an extrapolation of how many exoplanets there could be in the, in the Milky Way, they were able to come at a bigger estimate than the Kepler team from last year. And actually, they think there's a minimum of 100 billion exoplanets in our, in our uh, Milky Way. And they're actually saying that every star in the Milky Way could have at least one exoplanet in orbit. Now, this is astonishing. And obviously, it's, it's a very general estimate. But it is an estimate all the same. And I think it's going to really dictate the direction of exoplanetary studies in the near future. And I think, um, I think Alan also wrote on this, so he may have some other. Well, and, and I'd like to actually add one caveat to this. Um, when they say in the Milky Way, they're kind of ignoring the fact that we're pretty sure, pretty sure that none of the globular clusters, which are part of the outskirts of the Milky Way, have any planets. These suckers have been looked at this way, that way, every other way. They seem to be planet free. So the oh. idea that you have to have a certain number of metallicities, a certain amount of high-numbered uh, atoms in, in your star in order to have a planet. Uh, that's probably still there, and they simply got a little too colloquial in their language. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, another caveat to your caveat, um, on the outer limits of our Milky Way, the stars are known to have lower metallicity. So the opportunities for star-forming systems to exist in the outer rings of the Milky Way perhaps are lower. I, I'm not entirely sure if the statistics really cover that either. So that's, that's really, that was really the key bit of news. And then we've got loads of other spin-off uh, yeah. stories from this. I mean, did you want me to quickly run No, through? no, no. We've, you've, I think you've, you've given us a lot of information there, Ian. Okay. I, I think I hear your cell phone going off, Ian. Uh, no, it should be off. It should be off. No? should be off. Right. One second. Hear that uh, sound. Glasses. I'm turning mine off to make sure. Yeah. Uh, so, Nicole, uh, well, you're, actually, you're actually at WS this, this week. So was that just what everybody was talking about? Planets, planets, planets? I um, think for that's a while, thing, it's yeah. pretty much, yeah, on, on the Twitter stream that, that dominated. I was in some other, I was in like a professional development type talk at the time, and I could follow what was going on just on the, this is hashtag AAS219, or AAS219, and yeah, everyone was talking about these planets, and it's, it's cool to see, you know, research astronomers getting really excited about something, uh, something like that. And Alan, you, did you have anything to add to that? Because I know you, you were talking about A little bit, yeah. Uh, one is that... Uh, this sample actually doesn't take in everything that they think might be out there because they can only go down to a planet that's 
five times more massive than Earth. And so if you tried to look for planets like Earth with the survey, you wouldn't find them because it's not sensitive enough. And so there's a whole bunch of more planets that uh, don't come into this survey. Also, they could only go out as far as the orbit of a Saturn. So whether it's 50 billion or 100 and 100 billion, 160 billion, 250 billion, uh, the numbers are starting not to really matter all that much. There's just a heck of a lot of planets out there, and I think that's the bottom line. And uh, from other methods, uh, we're knowing that there's just this plenitude of planets out there. What I wrote was that the amazing thing is that this isn't so amazing to astronomers who have been studying this anymore, that it's pretty much an accepted fact that planets are the rule rather than the exception. And so I think as the years go on, we're going to get into, well, what kind of planets? Let's look for planets that are really interesting uh, because they're in a strange part of the menagerie, or maybe they're like Earth. Maybe they're the sorts of things that we can look at for, for life. And so I think we're starting to move beyond just the, the raw numbers and go into the quality of the uh, information about all these wonderful discoveries that we're coming up with. Well, I think the interesting thing is how every time you know astronomers make these new discoveries, it shatters the previous expectation of what a solar system could look like and what the configuration of planets and the sizes and their lo locations and what planet you know the hot Jupiters and <clears throat> and now we're seeing these these new configurations. And so I think at a certain point, it's almost like everything is possible. Yeah, uh, um, I talked with uh, Jeff Marcy, who is one of the pioneers in the planet hunting business, and, and he just is gushing about what Kepler is discovering. Of course, he's on the Kepler team, but he compares it to the explorations of the 15th and 16th century in the Americas or uh, putting uh, people on the moon. Uh, for him and for other astronomers studying this, these uh, findings are that revolutionary. That's amazing. All right, well, let's move on to, to our next topic this week. And this is, uh, this is uh, now, again, this is sort of the other big piece of news coming out of the AAS. And this is the discovery, or I guess the, the latest creation of a map of dark yeah. matter, dark matter, which confirms the amounts and quantities and, and, uh, of dark matter, but it's sort of at a higher level of precision. So, Pamela, do you want to talk about that? Right, so, so I was at the AAS up until yesterday when I needed to fly home to submit a grant because that's how we live. Um, and there's this amazing press conference where it was amazing, yes, we're getting it right, and now we're proving it at larger distances, result after result after result. The, the first one was a new survey done by the Canadian France Hawaii Telescope that mapped a one degree by one degree field on the sky. This is an area slightly bigger than the moon on the sky. And they looked at it at such a faint level that they were able to detect galaxies out to about 6 billion light years back. And as they did this, they were able to see how the light, as it passed through the distance, got distorted. Gravity acts like funhouse mirrors, changing how we're able to perceive galaxies at the greatest distances. And if we assume you average a group of galaxies' images together, you should always get a perfect circle and then look at deviations from that perfect circle at 5 billion years back, at 4 billion years back, at 3 billion. By making this stepping through the distance process, we can say, OK, at this distance, we see this mapping of dark matter acting like one funhouse, in this case, lens, not mirror. At this distance, we see dark matter doing this. And they generated a three-dimensional map of this lacy structure, kind of like Swiss cheese of dark matter. This follows up on the results of Cosmos survey several years ago, showing Cosmos was right in a new area of the sky, showing we can go back to greater distances, and it's still true. Our universe is this slowly collapsing nexus of dark matter. And at the places where walls of dark matter join together, there's clumps of luminous matter, the largest galaxy clusters we see. Along with this, we were able to see results that replicated what we saw with the bullet cluster. This is uh, two subclusters passing through each other, and this got replicated with a galaxy cluster called El Gordo that's at a much higher distance. El Gordo, we observed 7 billion light years back. And these are, again, systems where you have two subclusters 
merging together. They've passed through each other and the gas collided. But the luminous matter passed right through and so did the dark matter. And this is able to put constraints in dark matter showing it's probably many ways just like neutrinos. The stuff doesn't collide. It passes through each other like stars do when galaxies are colliding. And just more and more results were found. And we were actually able to go back. And folks discovered that there are clusters forming just a few million years after the cosmic microwave background was emitted. 13.1 um, billion years ago, there's clusters forming in the nexes of dark matter. It, it's amazing how this invisible stuff traces where we can find the luminous stuff in the universe. Do you think it tells us anything about the nature of dark matter or is it just still just a, a more of a confirmation that it, that it exists but you know nothing more than that? Well the, the discovery of El Gordo actually allows us to par start putting very specific constraints on the properties of dark matter. Uh, specifically because when the clusters passed through each other the dark matter didn't interact pretty much at all. You just had the dark matter and the stars passing through each other as you got the clusters ending up on other sides and the gas piled up in the middle. And by simulating how can this happen, this is where they start realizing the probability of two particles of dark matter, whatever those particles are, the probability is similar to the same probabilities we'd get with two clouds of neutrinos colliding with one another. So we're slowly getting down to what are the particle physics behaviors of the stuff. Um, slowly, slowly, we get there. And, uh, you know, Phil, I mean, I know you get a lot of questions from people about dark matter. People is like, you know, they don't cotton to know dark matter. You know, I don't like it. It's dark. <laughs> you know, where does it right. come from? You know, so, so how, do you, how does this sort of, does this strengthen, you know, the argument, the battle? Not to me. No. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm convinced. You've, you know, the, the evidence is overwhelming that dark matter exists. It's been... Uh, the evidence has been out there for decades, uh, going back to Vera Rubin and, um, and, and Fritz Zwicky back, you know, observing galaxies and the way galaxies spin around back in the, in the, in the 20th century, a million years ago. Uh, the bullet cluster was, was pretty much the proof because uh, when we saw the galaxies in these two clusters uh, ramming together and all of the normal matter, the, the, the normal gas, was, was, was hitting each other head on and basically stopping and you could see that all the dark matter which was being mapped in the same method by how it was distorting galaxies behind it uh, that was clearly going right through each other it was totally non-interactive yeah. and yet we know that there was stuff there and so the bullet cluster was pretty much uh, the nail in the coffin the, the final bullet in the cluster I don't know what you call it <laughs> but it's pretty clear you know and, and there's there are a lot of other reasons we know that dark matter is out there there are always going to be people who want to deny whatever the next step is in, in the search for truth, whether it was uh, the universe had a beginning, it had a hot, small, dense beginning like the Big Bang, that it did this, that it did that after the Big Bang. Uh, and now, you know, now we're on dark matter and dark energy. Uh, you know, I had my doubts about dark energy as well for a long time, but it, once it was announced, uh, it seemed really strange. But over time, the evidence piles up. And so this is just, you know, one more incremental step. Eventually... Uh, unless those people come up with better evidence than what we've got, and they, they haven't so far. Eventually, that'll be forgotten in the search for truth. Yeah, I think uh, it's one of these situations where it, it's almost like it's just the name or something. Like, it just sounds so mysterious that they don't, they don't like it. So it's almost like people have an emotional reaction to it. Um, all right, well, let's move on to, a, to an interesting story. I guess this didn't come from AAS. This actually comes from CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. And this is the uh, announcement of a, was a new XPRIZE to create a tricorder. Alan, you reported on yeah. this. Uh, yeah, I, um, CES is the other big conference going on this week. And uh, they don't do many space stories, but this one was... Uh, uh, had a space angle to it, very, very interesting. Actually, they announced this uh, X Prize, the latest $10 million X Prize, uh, last year, but they provided a few more details about it. Uh, the, as you remember, uh, the first $10 million X Prize was for private space flight, and Spaceship One won that one, and there's been a whole series since then. This one is sponsored by Qualcomm and organized by the X Prize Foundation to create a Star Trek tricorder. 
And uh, that's, <laughs> that sounds like something from the 23rd century. But actually, uh, I've been reporting on this uh, quest for the tricorder, it turns out, for a decade that uh, NASA Administrator Dan Golden was working with some cancer researchers to try to get this sort of thing going. You know, a handheld device, now it looks like a smartphone. On Star Trek, it used to look like a big cassette recorder, but they've uh, miniaturized it since then. And uh, the idea is that you could use this to diagnose all sorts of diseases just by kind of holding it out um, next to a patient. Uh, for the XPRIZE competition, you probably could have sensors that you can place on the skin, but the idea is that it's not supposed to be invasive, that there will be no needles, nothing drawn, you don't throw something down your throat. And uh, you would be able to get a monitoring of your uh, of your cardio health and your respiratory system, and and uh, actually diagnose up to 15 diseases. The 15 diseases have not been identified yet, but all these sorts of uh, details are supposed to be worked out in the course of the next month. And. and uh, I People have been working on this for years and years. Uh, usually they talk about some sort of ultrasound device that should be able to, to do all sorts of diagnosis with to see what the internal health state is. And uh, the plan is that uh, you would have people the plan is that you would have people uh, entering this. Uh, the head of the XPRIZE Foundation, Peter Diamandis, says he thinks that scores of uh, teams are going to be entering this competition, uh, leading up to kind of a diagnose-off in mid-2015, where, uh, <laughs> where 30 people, 30 regular consumers would be diagnosed and they'd have their health checked and the accuracy and the ease and the usability of the uh, diagnosis would determine who gets the $10 million. There might be some ethical issues. I don't know if they like bring a bunch of people with pre-existing conditions, you know, find somebody yeah. with malaria and find somebody with you know, cancer, and then try to... <laughs> have you, ever seen, <laughs> have you ever seen that si Seinfeld episode uh, where uh, Kramer wants to play the guy who has, uh, uh, you know, one particular disease and somebody else kind of horns in on him and, and portrays uh, portrays the, the this disease? Uh, so uh, uh, it, it, it could get pretty interesting. People might find out that they've got conditions that they didn't know they had. But... Yeah. Uh, you know, you, the mind boggles when you think about this. But that doesn't really strike me as such a terrible thing. Right. You know, if I go in for a test and they say, oh, and by the way, you've got this. Well, I'm glad you caught it. Exactly. And, and honestly, can you imagine how awesome it would be to be able to say, I knew I had this disease and I want to prevent other people from getting late diagnosis. So I'm going to put the fact that I have this disease public to allow these people to test their tricorders. I, I think that's something where they can easily find the volunteers to help advance medicine if all it means is revealing you have something so that you can help other people who have the same thing. Right, well, we're uh, already seeing that with uh, genomics, that uh, people are getting their genomes done, and uh, I think Craig Venter uh, has released his whole genome, and so I think that might be something that people talk about just as they're talking about open access today. Uh, how much do you want to reveal about yourself, and is that going to be helpful for other people, or are there some things that you don't want to share with other folks, so it's going to be a whole new frontier of privacy. Yeah, My big concern is actually self-diagnosis. You know, people go to WebMD because they have a scratch on their face and they find out, you know, oh, I have degenerative brain cloud or something. <laughs> and, and so you know, that's something they'll have to worry about. The, the ethical dilemma of participating in the study is no big deal. That's, that's no different than all the medical studies that have ever been done. Making it public, you know, people have yeah. to be fully aware they're doing Live it. Live on television, that. you've got cancer. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? Look, you know, go go look at the, the higher level cable channels and tell me that people won't have any problem, uh, you, know, so, you know, saying, I have this horrifying disease. They'll do it just to be on TV. Yeah. But yeah. the idea behind this is to make health care more efficient. The, the backers of the prize say this will revolutionize health care and it will remove a lot of the bureaucra bureaucratic uh, inefficiency that we have in the system right now. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, it, it sounds like uh, maybe a little bit of wishful thinking, but uh, it, it, if they actually come up with a device like this, uh, you could have uh, folks 
you know, benefiting from having a diagnosis where you don't even really need to go through all these invasive tests to find out how healthy you are. But will they, you know, install them at the door jams of public spaces? You, know, you, try, to, you try to go through a, you try to go through a, I don't know, a subway turnstile, and you're right. an email that you've that you've got to type two diabetes or something. Right. You know, like you can imagine, or you know, not wanting to spread diseases. You can imagine people getting on airplanes and being scanned to make sure that they don't have some kind of communicable disease. Communicable disease. So I think, you know, I can definitely see there are some interesting uh, and troubling uh, ethical implications. But, but I say bring it on. Let's, you know, I'm not saying let's not do it. Like, let's do it, but we'll figure it out. And one on. last thing, uh, the space angle on all this is that NASA wants to have these sorts of devices so that they can have health care when you're on the International Space Station or when you're on the way to Mars when uh, you may not be able to have a physician team looking after you 24-7. All right, well, let's move on to our, to our fourth story. And this, this is another report coming out of the American Astronomical Society. And this was, uh, this was written by Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. And this is what color the Milky Way really is. So what yeah. color is it, Nancy? Well, you know, we've written a lot of articles on Universe Today about how we don't really know how our Milky Way galaxy looks from the outside because we're inside and we can't see the whole thing. And, uh, you know, there's been some I different ideas about how many spiral arms it has and, uh, you know, if it has a central bar, that kind of thing. But, you know, we don't really know the color of it as well. The main dominant integrated color that uh, aliens looking through their telescope would, would see, uh, you know, how the Milky Way w would appear to them. Um, and it turns out that the Milky Way has approximately the right name, but for all the wrong reasons. Uh, even though it does look kind of milky white to our eyes from Earth and and also to our ancestors' eyes who gave the name Milky Way to the band of stars that stretches across the sky. The true color of the Milky Way, according to Dr. Jeffrey Newman from the University of Pittsburgh, is that it is as white as fine-grained new spring snow in the early morning light, which is basically one of the whitest colors that there is here on Earth. Now, when you do look up in, at the sky with your, just with your eyes, yeah, the stars up there across the Milky Way look white, but you've probably noticed when you see a picture from a really good camera or a really good telescope, you will see different colors. And that's because our human eyes aren't really, um, they can't really see those sensitive colors. You know, we have very low, low light vision. Um, but anyway, um, so how do they determine what color our galaxy is? Um, when, uh, when we do look at other galaxies, we, ca we can see them in, in their entirety, and uh, we can examine them for color density, which um, has been great tools in astronomy for helping us to understand stars and galaxies. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get a complete picture of the Milky Way, so um, we resort to other methods, and that's kind of like comparing our galaxy to other galaxies. And Newman and his team looked at about uh, over 100, you know, hundreds of galaxies in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And they found ones that should be like the Milky Way. Uh, they have similar properties in regards to total mass and star formation rates. And they, then they compare the color and luminosity. And uh, the Milky Way should fall on a plot somewhere within the range of, of the uh, colors of, of other galaxies. And uh, so they determined the color is this kind of snowy white. Um, there are portions of our galaxy, of course, that are more yellow, like towards the center and more blue out in the spiral arms, but um, basically the composite color is snowy white. And uh, I thought the most interesting kind of artsy, fartsy thing was that Newman wrote a haiku about the color. He said, uh, his haiku is, look at new spring snow, see the river of heaven an hour after dawn. Well, that's really nice. Wow. Yeah. I, I, we haven't had a lot of uh, stories that include haikus. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's move on, unless someone, someone had any questions. I actually that. find one on my blog right now. Oh, really? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, there was a, a bit of that a while ago. I remember there was a story that we worked on a few years ago about the color of the universe and sort of what the average color of the universe was, and, and that keeps changing as well. And yeah, that was awesome because they came out with the press release and like a week later came out with a correction to the press release because yeah. the color, they just realized, oh, no, we weren't quite right. Yeah. Not beige, it's green. It's green. Yeah, yeah. Or some other color. Um, okay, cool. Then let's move on to our last story. And uh, <coughs> this is a bit of planetary news. 
And uh, Emily, you've been reporting on the work of NASA's Dawn mission, which has been currently mapping asteroid Vesta, and it's sort of reached a new milestone, right? That's right. It actually, it's actually last month that it reached the um, low-altitude mapping orbit. But um, the, the news this week is that they've gotten really sneaky and are going to get a lot more science out of the mission than they expected. Um, the deal is, and, and because I love Phil's visual aid so much, I've made my own little visual aid here. This box represents the Dawn spacecraft. And you can see that on one side, it's got a radio antenna. And most of the instruments are on the other side. So there's two kinds of science that the Dawn mission is trying to do from VESTA um, at this low altitude mapping orbit. One of them requires one of the science instruments, the red one here called GRAND, to be pointing at the, um, the asteroid as it orbits around. And that's slowly accumulating in, uh, neutron detections, which will help them identify the composition of the surface. The other thing that they want to do is take the radio antenna and constantly face the radio antenna at Earth so that they can do Doppler tracking to get at the gravity of Vesta. Um, and the problem is that, that those two are mutually exclusive. They can't keep the radio antenna, high gain radio antenna, pointed at Earth all the time and also keep the instrument pointed at the spacecraft all the time. But what they've figured out is that they don't actually need the high gain antenna to do their gravity work. They can use a low gain antenna. A low gain antenna doesn't need to be pointed in any particular direction. It broadcasts in a, in a really wide cone. And there's actually low gain antennas, that's this little black triangle, on both sides of the spacecraft. So it doesn't really matter which way the spacecraft is oriented. You can actually continuously get the radio data you need for gravity information, regardless of which direction the spacecraft is pointed. So they can take their little red instrument here, GRAND, and keep it pointed at VESTA all the time, build up their neutron data. The longer they do that, the higher resolution their data gets, the more sensitive they are to minor constituents. Um, and at the same time, they're getting this highly detailed gravity map, which is really important for such a small and lumpy body as VESTA. So that's some really good news. The other piece of good news is that they had built into their schedule a total of, I believe it was 40 days um, that, uh, of schedule slop to allow for any, um, to, for, to deal with safe modes or anything on the spacecraft. And it turns out that they didn't need a single one of those days, so they're going to be able to get that much more science built in um, to their schedule. They're going to add a lot more um, high resolution images, a lot more grand integ integration before they have to raise their altitude again this summer in order to depart Vesta for series, which it'll arrive at in a few more years. You see all that, everybody? Uh, you know, Emily brought her own little prop. Now, she's a total pro. So everyone take notes for, for next week. Thanks, I want to see all I want to see all kinds of uh, <laughs> props and I have a name tag. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So so that's I guess how so how much more science mapping time is there going to be at Vesta? before it starts to make the maneuver to move to, to Ceres? It's going to start raising its orbit in a couple of months. It has to depart for Ceres um, late this summer, um, actually at around the same time that Curiosity will be landing on Mars. So um, summer will be fairly eventful. But you have to remember that Dawn is an ion-powered spacecraft. It doesn't do anything quickly. Everything is very slow. So when they depart the low-altitude mapping orbit, it's not a big rocket burn that's going to send it to a much higher orbit. It's going to be slowly spiraling farther and farther away from, from the asteroid, and, and when it departs, it's just going to be receding very, very, very slowly. So we should get some nice departure images, too, of you know, waving bye-bye to Vesta as it, as it disappears in Dawn's rearview mirror this summer. What, one of the amazing things about the Dawn mission is it's actually getting so much data that the scientists can't handle all of it by themselves. So they're in the process of putting together a citizen science project that actually I think about half the people on this, this vid conference are, are engaged in. And all of that's going to be part of the CosmoQuest citizen science community. Um, we just launched a moon mappers project over there. So if you want to get engaged with Vesta, give me about four weeks to finish writing the site. And then all of us can help understand Vesta. And we're going to be working on series when it gets there in 2015. So so this was all of the uh, all of the topics that we had planned to discuss, but I think everyone's got a few more minutes. So if anyone wants to ask any questions of the team about not necessarily just the stuff we talked about today, but but anything space and astronomy related, uh, just post them into the comments that's on the on the post that that this video is embedded in, and then I'll sort of troll through it and, and answer some questions if anybody, if anybody has any questions. Well, while you're looking for that, I wanted to add one thing to the Vesta. Um, 
we got uh, at the AAS meeting, we got to look at some really pretty pictures of Vesta, not at the conference itself, but after watching Armageddon. So a whole bunch <laughs> of astronomers got together to watch Armageddon at the Alamo Draft House, and basically there, somebody had a buzzer and buzzed every time there was something scientifically inaccurate, um, like the asteroid itself. And so we got to see pi cool pictures, real pictures of Vesta uh, on the big screen after that movie. Totally different from what Michael Bay envisioned. That's fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an asteroid the size of Texas, isn't it? About? Ceres is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's only like one, right? As big as Texas. It's cool. oh, it's in, so there isn't even an asteroid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Astronomers have, d have discovered 200 years ago an asteroid the size of Texas. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so Heather Moore asks a question. Uh, do we, any of you have any thoughts about why we can't find any self-replicating probes in our neighborhood? Whoa. I do. I have yeah. a lot of thoughts about that. Bill? It, it, it Bill. <laughs> if they were here, they would have destroyed us by now. So, uh, my my feeling is the idea. I, I think that what she's asking is, uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna explore the galaxy and faster than light travel is not possible, which is pretty much what we think. Yeah. Sending a human to another star, you you either have to use unbelievably high accelerations, which would turn them into paste, or you have to wait a long time, thousands and thousands of years. So that's, it's, it's not a good way to do it. A better way to do it is to send a probe which has software on it that allows it to land on, say, a nickel-iron asteroid, uh, not too different than Vesta, for example, although Vesta's mostly rock, but doesn't matter. You find one, <laughs> and you, you basically let out these little probes. They mine it. They build more of their own little probes. They build more rockets, and poof, they go off in different directions. And what happens is you can explore the galaxy pretty quickly that way. Uh, whereas it might take forever to go from star to star to star. Every time you go to a star, you're generating more of these probes that go out. You can, you can basically explore the whole galaxy in just a few million years, which is not very long compared to the age of the galaxy, which is billions of years. And the this question is, go ahead, Pamela. Th this all relates to what's called the Fermi paradox, which is where right. the scientist Fermi one day basically went, where are they? Yeah, you can, if you can colonize the galaxy in a very short period compared to the age of the galaxy, you'd expect aliens to be here by now. They're not here. Now, maybe they were here 30 million years ago, did their business and left. You know, we'd never know but, uh, unless they left us a message, which is possible. Uh, but it's an interesting question. And, and the other question is, how would you know? What, yeah. How would you leave an unambiguous uh, signal? Or, and would they leave an unambiguous signal? Would they care? And at that point, you're starting to question alien psychology, and at that point I just say, no, nah, I don't think you can, you can do that. You can just talk about physics and math and, and you know, what might drive them to explore in the first place. But when you start talking about real questions about what they would want to do, eh, I think you're probably, uh, it's, it's just conjecture. But if we find a monolith, we wouldn't yeah. be ashamed yeah. to go look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. One of the things that people talk about is that uh, uh, everyone says, uh, gee, we would be the new kids on the block when it comes to intelligence in the universe. But uh, when you think about it, it takes a long time for the elements to develop. You have to go through several generations of star formation. And so I've, I've heard some people say that really maybe uh, we're not all that new, maybe uh, this is kind of the first, it takes four billion years or more to, to really get things going, and so maybe we shouldn't expect that we have super intelligent civilizations out there. Maybe we're farther along than we think. Yeah, there's a, lo there's a, there's a really good book, and I'm, it's, the title is, I'm forgetting right now, but it was, it was essentially a whole bunch of arguments for the per Fermi Paradox to sort of explain why, why we haven't seen the aliens. Rare Earth. No, it wasn't rare. No, it was rare. a different no. one. Yeah, it was a different book. It was sort of like a bunch of arguments about why we haven't, why we haven't seen aliens. Like Fifty solutions to the Fermi paradox. Something like yes, yeah, that's I think that's what it's okay. called. Yeah, that's right. And so it sort of talks about like you know maybe we're in a cosmic zoo. Maybe you know yeah. the aliens work in a different sort of level. Maybe they communicate in ways that we just can't possibly understand. You know, et cetera. So maybe they wipe them all themselves all out, or maybe it's just too far. Maybe international. Space travel is impossible. So it's it's quite interesting to sort of think through. There are yeah. explanations, but I but I do think that that it's a pretty compelling argument. Well, th um, there are three main categories for all those arguments. You know, one of them is like prime directive, and they don't have a Kirk that breaks it all the time. You know, the other one is you know you start have to guess in psychology. They're here, but they're not exploring or haven't reached us or they died out. Uh, and then the other major one is is like Alan said, where the 
we're the first ones. Um, so it, and it that's the most terrifying were, option. Yes. That were, the, that were the first ones, yeah. Imagine um, we're the most advanced civilization. Well, it's not unlikely. I, you know, people say that seems very unlikely. It's like, well, not really. No, I mean, not. what Alan was saying is that it takes a certain amount of time to cook up the necessary ingredients to make life. Uh, now, life emerged on Earth just as soon as the Earth cooled enough to, to have liquid water on its surface, but it took a while to get to that point. Uh, so it, it's not hugely out of the question for that to be. The only thing that worries me or that concerns me about that argument is 100 million years is still a drop in the bucket compared to yeah. 10 billion years. And so you could, you could easily have had the, roughly the same amount of heavy elements, you know, iron, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, all those kind of things brewed in the galaxy long before, you know, before the Earth formed. So it, 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 it's still, it, we're speculating. It's, it's, like, it's like where exoplanets were 15 years ago. We only had the example of our solar system. Now we have hundreds. You know, so hopefully sometime soon we'll start discovering uh, more interesting evidence for life in outer space and we'll be able to get a better handle on, on whether we're alone or not. I'll go grab another question here. So Raven Schmidt wants to know, is it going to be possible to find Earth-sized exoplanets in the future? And if so, how long until we have that technology? Uh, John, do you have an answer for that one? Yeah, uh, we have the technology. In fact, we've done it. We've done it. Uh, I think yes, in the past few weeks, there's been a couple announcements about uh, Earth-sized exoplanets in that range. Uh, they announced these most three recent ones were more close to the size of Venus, I believe. So we have the technology. Uh, this is kind of the main goal of the Kepler mission, was to find Earth-sized exoplanets. But uh, it's something that's definitely being done, and especially this year, you're probably going to be hearing a lot of announcements about that. So the, the reason that we're able to just do it now is in order for a planet to be confirmed by Kepler, it has to have its orbit seen three times. Kepler's entering its third year, which means throughout the year, things that were observed in year one will be doing their third transit at an orbit the size of Earth's orbit. Um, now, John K. wants to know, what are the telescopes that the panel personally uses to enjoy the night sky? So <clears throat> we have no night sky where I live on uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island, so it's just cloudy and it rains. So, but I have a, uh, I have a Galileo scope, and I have a Celestron first scope, which is sort of a tiny little telescope. Both are very inexpensive. And then I have a Celestron, I even forget what it is, it's a go-to, sort of a six-inch Newtonian that I have at my dad's place where it's a little darker and the skies are clear. Anyone else got a telescope? Actually, I, I have an answer to that one, which is that I don't own a telescope. I know nothing about observational astronomy, but I look at space a lot through the eyes of spacecraft. Yeah. And you can do that, too, by going to the Raw Images website for the Cassini mission and the Mars Exploration Rover mission right now are both putting out all their images uh, pretty much straight to the Internet as soon as they arrive on Earth. And that's how I look at space. Yeah. I've got a uh, Celestron C8, so 8-inch schmidt cast grain. Me, too. I'm building a radio telescope in South Africa. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Do you really enjoy you could, those yeah, pictures? Yeah, yeah. You, could have, you, you could have a bumper sticker that says, my other telescope is in South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a, an 8-inch uh, Dobsonian uh, Orion uh, telescope and uh, also a Galileo scope, mostly just to support the Galileo scope project, which is such a cool project. Yeah, um. Galileo scopes are actually still being sold, and um, yeah, there's surprises to come that we'll hopefully bring up in the next three weeks that I just learned about yesterday. So even Fraser and Phil, who I work with, don't know about those surprises yet. Oh man, tease. Oh boy, Pamela. <laughs> um, one thing that we do, if if you want to get a sense of sort of what you can see with a telescope, we've been running these virtual star parties with. Uh, you know, they're getting more and more elaborate and complicated each time we do it, but but we're getting you know hopefully now multiple telescopes all streaming a live view from their scope right into a Google Plus Hangout and then we get some color commentary from me and Phil and, and Pamela and, and other astronomers that we can we can wrangle in and so and we talk about you know and there's different qualities of telescope and different qualities of cameras and even the different ways they've been configured and so if you're interested in, in astronomy uh, keep an eye out for these. We're still doing them very randomly while we're while people are we're figuring this out. But but if you follow, if you circle uh, me or Phil or Pamela, you'll probably see.
see when they when they pop up in the stream. Oh, a couple of other little bit more housekeeping, which is if you're watching the stream right now and you have the ability, then if you can plus one the this post so we can kind of get a sense of of how many people are watching it, that would be really helpful. Um, and then the uh, and then the other thing is you'll see a list of all the participants and they all give great space news, so you should circle them if you have if you haven't already. Um, so I think we got. Uh, how's everyone's time? I think we can tackle a couple more questions and then and then wrap it up. Um, let's see. Thanks. Okay. So Curtis O'Neill wants to know how long is the Kepler mission going to last, and when it if it finishes, are there plans for another similar mission to search for exoplanets? Anyone? Who knows Kepler? Well, there's talk about extending the mission uh, that uh, it's supposed to wrap up uh, pretty soon in the next uh, fiscal year, but uh, they want to keep it going because uh, in order to find those small planets, you really have to have enough time for those planets to go around their orbits. And so I would check out uh, the campaign to get more funds for Kepler and uh, let your Congress representative know about that. Uh, yeah. There's the big the big mission that we've been complaining about on Astronomy Cast for probably five years now is yeah. is the loss of the terrestrial planet finder and the the plan for that was that you take it to the next level which is that once you uh, have imaged uh, or once you've detected a planet then you pull in this really powerful telescope and attempt to image the atmosphere of these of these planets and if you could do that then you can determine if there's Pretty much, you can determine if there's life around those uh, around those planets. And I've heard rumblings that that there might be some kind of atmosphere detection mission in the works at this point. I don't know if anyone has, has heard about that at all. Does anyone happen to know with Kepler? Uh, right now, it's pointed at uh, the constellation Cygnus to look for planets. How possible is it to just kind of adjust where it's looking and start potentially extending that mission, looking at some other portion of the sky? Well, it, it, it's possible, but I think the real issue with doing things like that, I mean, it, it, the, it's a mission that, that it has to be able to, to flop around in order to stay on track. So it, it has all the technologies to repoint. Um, but the, the issue is if you repoint, you don't get to continue looking for smaller and smaller planets. Um, with, with NASA spacecraft, they budget them for a certain number of years and they build the instruments with a pretty much, we've engineered these so that we know they last that long. But they're pretty good about keeping things going as long as data is coming in. Chandra, for instance, it's many, many times it's, it's projected use and rumor at AAS is engineers are now saying it has a good another 20 years of life in it. Wow. Um, so as long as Kepler is happily re returning data, I suspect they'll keep pushing until they can find Mercury, um, little tiny things at Jupiter's orbit, which I'm not quite sure they can do, but they'll keep pushing while they find things at greater and greater orbits over time. I think the key thing as well with, uh, with Kepler, the uh, funding went up until three and a half years after it was launched, I think, the, the initial funding. And that really is the limit of discovering a true Earth-sized, Earth-sized, not Earth-like, Earth-sized world orbiting the habitable zone around a sun-like star because they, they will have an identical orbital period as Earth going around our, our Sun. So to actually find that little world orbiting within that 365-day orbit around a Sun-like star, it's really at the limit of its funding. So for it to be, if it was just cut off at three and a half years or four years, that would be a travesty because that would be it. And there's no guarantee they'd even be able to detect that Earth-sized Earth planet within that time. So it would, it's logical if the thing is still working, which it obviously is because NASA is very good at building these, these instruments, um, it's logical to have its, have its uh, time extended. But again, then we're dealing with politics, as we There's found with the James Webb Telescope. Yeah, they'll absolutely extend it. And if they yeah. won't, we'll do a Kickstarter and we'll extend it. There's <laughs> yeah. no way. Like, this is like the most can important do discovery in you know, human history, finding other Earths. So, you know, I think it's worth continuing. I'm sure, it'll, I'm sure the finding will happen. Of course, the fact that the, the spacecraft are all lasting so long does present an interesting funding problem for NASA. I remember hearing uh, a, a story about an administrator remarking that he just kind of wished the rovers would die because, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're taking, they are taking money that was allocated someplace else. It, opportunity, it, this is 
the eighth anniversary of its landing on Mars. It was supposed to last, or it was warranted to last three months. Cassini was supposed to last four years. It's going on until, I forget, 2015, 2016. So, um, it, and that money does have to come from somewhere. So NASA budgets do get squeezed when they are too successful. The Voyager and, and missions are still working. Yeah, and, and mind you, it's not, just, it's not just money. It's also what they're doing. Uh, Hubble was designed to be periodically upgraded as technology got better. So I worked on a camera that was put in in 1997. There are cameras that were put in just a few years ago that are hugely advanced compared to what was originally launched on Hubble. So you kind of have to decide. You know, Cassini is now you know, 10 years old or, or more, that technology. On the other hand, it's at Saturn. So you have to balance between what you've got and what you could have. And of course, NASA has a finite budget. So these are very, very difficult decisions. And, and, I, and so I, just, to, just to finish that thought, I would not want to be in the position of saying, you know, I've got this much money. I've got these things which are running great. Should I cancel them for something which may not launch or whatever? And that's what's happening right now, especially in this era of budget cuts. And one of the balancing factors, uh, NASA and NSF are both in the process of trying to figure out what do we do now that Congress didn't give us the budget we had anticipated even in our worst case scenario? Well, the money necessary to build large new missions just really isn't there. But the amount of money needed to keep these little missions going is so much smaller than the, the money necessary to build a new spacecraft that at least we have options. So we don't know what the outcome is going to be, but in the situation where we can't build, that new Europa Explorer, that new Jupiter Explorer that we want, at least we can keep looking. And that's a powerful thing. I was just going to say that the European Space Agency is talking about another planet hunting mission called PLATO. And so if you do a search on PLATO and European Space Agency, you'll find out more information about that. They're looking at that in the 2015 to 2025 time period. That's a, that's a long way to think about yeah. these kinds of missions, yeah. And it's not just um, space, I want to point out, it's not just NASA that's having this problem. Ground-based astronomy, you also have the situation where perfectly good and serviceable, because they're on the ground, uh, telescopes are getting you know, closed or defunded or losing funding to make room for new, for new big telescopes. There's just not enough money and resources to go around, even for ground-based astronomy. So I, I, got one, I think I've got one last question, and this one comes from Jeremy Lusk. And uh, he says, uh, what kept you going in grad school? <laughs> I, so Nicole, you're you're sort of closest to that right now. Yeah, ask me in <coughs> ask me in May. So yeah, you, you're not quite done yet. No, I'm not. I don't know. People being fantastic is what keeps me going. Africa. That too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going to South Africa. Yeah. Your gig and, yeah, the gigantic radio telescope they're constructing for your like that. future world domination plans in Africa. I exactly. I think it boils down in a lot of cases of we love so much what we're doing that we're willing to get paid very small portions of money to stay up all night on a regular basis because we have to get things done on other people's deadlines. But it's so rare to get the opportunities that we get that we're willing to make all the personal sacrifices to get to go sit on top of a mountain and in my case use a 107 inch telescope for over 100 nights. I think it's fair to say that if you don't love what you're doing in graduate school, you probably ought to think about options other than academia, which is what I did. You know, I, I finished with a master's degree and I said, you know, I really love space a lot, but this whole working 12, 14 hours a day to write a paper that might get published and if it's published, it might get read by seven people, I was like, no. Yeah, I think we've got <laughs> some, different, some different career paths, right? Because for me, I went to school for engineering and computer science and definitely never had plans to get a PhD and just jump right into doing com you know, computers and software and, and publishing. So I think you can definitely find your way to your, your career as long as you do what you love. Yeah, it's all about passion, but it's also finding a balance as well. Because I think I suffered burnout a few times. And the only thing that actually repaired the burnout was a social life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Actually going outside and spending going, going away from the computer or the telescope just just for a short while, get and some beer and then an occasional pint. The yeah, I, <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> you know Alan. You know it. <laughs> like the, there's a beer to caffeine ratio that you have to keep going. <laughs> 
I switched over at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And it's confounded by the desire <laughs> to avoid the real world. Um, okay, well, I think we can wrap it up at this point. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks to all the panel for reporting in on your, on your space news. Uh, if you've enjoyed this... <laughs> if you've... If you've uh, um, so if you're watching this right now, just one last thing. If you can plus one it just to so we can get some counts to get an idea of, of how many people were watching it. And then we will do this again, uh, same bat time, same bat channel, uh, which is, I guess, the Internet, um, at, uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 1800 UTC every Thursday. And hopefully we'll see all of you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Back home. <laughs>